Good evening, everybody. My name is Paul Schluckman. I am the vice chair of the Arlington School Committee. Dr. Allison Ampey is with us tonight remotely, so I will be chairing the meeting. Uh, this is the meeting of uh, February 29th. Happy Leap Day. Um, we are operating remote. Uh, we are operating with remote. We have uh, um, a hybrid setup tonight uh, because Dr. Allison Ampey is on hybrid. Um, just a reminder to everyone that uh, under these rules, we have to do all roll call votes. Um, uh, and I will ask uh, the people who are on remote right now to respond. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Okay, and Jenna Medeiros is our AEA representative. Can you hear us? Hi, yes, I can. Okay, so we're in good shape. Uh, reminder to anybody who is interacting with us through the wonders of Zoom that uh, if your mics are on or your cameras are on, we can see or hear what's up. So uh, please be aware. Uh, first order of business will be a moment of silence. Unfortunately, we have learned of the tragic death of our former town clerk, Corinne Rainville, who is somebody we've all interacted with, who is a consummate professional. A wonderful friend for us all and for me personally we shared a birthday and so I always made it a point to wander by town hall on that date just to celebrate with her um, it's a tremendous loss and so a moment of silence for Corinne please thank you and now for um, public comment. We have nobody in the room and nobody has signed up for public comment, so we'll move on to the Arlington High student representatives. I have one on the list, Amy Chiralu, and you'd want somebody else with you, right? Would you uh, pull down the microphone and introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Asra. I'm the vice president for the class of 27. Uh, congratulations. Welcome. Do you uh, have a report of what's happening in our beloved high school? Yes, I don't know if anyone had the pleasure of going to the All Town concert last night, but everyone from grades elementary school up to high school did fantastic. Uh, the opening of our new school cafe was on Tuesday. If any of you guys want to cross over a little concrete ramp and check it out, I would very much recommend it. The dumplings are fantastic. And not the last, uh, last but not least, I'd recommend checking out the AHS Zoo. Most recently, yesterday, we got an axolotl. And there's tarantulas and cockroaches and goldfish and anything anything you'd really want to see. So I would recommend going to the fourth and fifth floors of the steam wing to go check out some animals, but no petting. <laughs> Not that kind of zoo. I don't think you want to pet the uh, cockroaches, <laughs> do you? <laughs> okay, anything else? Thank I you for... I want to shout out gymnastics for having a record-breaking season and breaking their own record in points, not once, but twice in this year. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next mm -hmm. up will be field trip approval. Dr. Janger or... Mr. Barasa. Mr. Barasa. Speaking with yeah. us. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, yes, we can. Great. Um, thank you so much for, um, for having me um, <clears throat> check in with you. I appreciate your patience and, um, and the time um, you're, uh, you're allotting me. Um, so we have officially been formally invited back um, to visit our sister city, Nagoka Kyo, uh, Japan. Um, as some, if not all of you know, um, I first was involved in the trip in 2010 and I spent two years uh, as you know one of the exchange teachers in Nagoka Kyo. So um, I miss Sonoe Toyama and everyone in Nagoka Kyo is, is just, very, very important to me, um, as I know, you know, we all have um, different, just really lovely relationships that um, we've all developed uh, through the Sister City Exchange Program. Um, as you know, it's the 40th anniversary of the Sister City relationship and the 20th anniversary of the first time we successfully completed um, a student um, exchange. Um, so we understand that it is late in the game, um, but we just heard back, I think, on February 13th or 14th from any travel agent that we reached out to with an actual um, price point and itinerary. Um, we have only gauged interest so far. 
um, because we're obviously waiting for the trip to be approved. Um, but we are requesting um, the opportunity to go back. Uh, Ms. Toyama has formally invited us back for uh, a 10 day stay in July. Um, so we have the information that we can answer questions. I don't want to um, belabor the point. I'm happy to keep talking, but I know you have plenty of other very important things. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions you might have um, or continue talking about the trip um, if that's the easiest thing for you. <laughs> it's a delightful time of the year to be there for the for the wonderful July weather in Nagaokakao. It's about 6,000 degrees with 500% humidity. <laughs> yeah, that's basically what it is. It's like yeah. Alabama in August. Mm -hmm. uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, do I see a motion? So moved. Motion by Mr. Thielman, seconded by... Uh, Liz, <laughs> there are too many Liz's in this room. Um, second by, by Ms. Exton, um, all in favor, uh, roll call. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Carden? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. Oh, you, forgot, you forgot Ms. Morgan. Oh, did I, I, I can't see you over there. Ms. Morgan. <laughs> yes. Uh, the, the, this, uh, we need a curve, um, and, and I vote in the affirmative. That's a seven, nothing vote. Uh, congratulations. Is, um, Dr. Janger going with you? He is scheduled. So I'm currently not planning on traveling myself only because I'm working out a little, um, blood clot situation. Um, and flying that long is not advised. Um, I'm hoping to, um, return next year, but I'm going to be setting everything up, language and culture classes. Um, and he's very excited. And Ms. Toyama is incredibly excited to have an administrator uh, visit. Oh, yeah. He, he will be treated like a VIP. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Um, next up is the literacy screening update with Dr. Ford Walker. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I am here to present a brief update on the literacy screener process for the district. Um, as of July 1st, 2023, Massachusetts regulation states that all schools require, are required to screen all K-3 students for early literacy skills. I've shared the regulation here um, just for your reference, but basically the summary is that school districts shall assess each student's reading ability and progress at least two times per year. If screening determines that a student is significantly below benchmark for age typical development and specific literacy skills, the school uh, shall determine which actions within the general education program uh, should be taken in order to meet the student's needs. Um, and this may include differentiating instruction or providing a supplementary evidence-based reading instruction program um, and ongoing monitoring of progress. And also within 30 school days of screening, results are, if the results are significantly below the relevant benchmark, uh, then each school is responsible for sharing that information with parents and guardians, um, and also have a follow-up <coughs> conversation with the parent and guardian. The early universal uh, screening assessment tool that we use here in APS is the Dynamic Indicators of Basic Early Literacy Skills, or what is known as DIBBLES. DIBBLES are measures used to determine how students are performing on specific skills. Skills uh, that are measured include phonemic awareness, uh, phonics, fluency, vocabulary, and comprehension. The tests are indicators of the student's overall reading status and are not intended to be an in-depth analysis or a comprehensive measure of reading. And administration of the DIBBLES assessments typically takes about one to three minutes per uh, assessment, per test. This year, our testing window for our first through third graders was September, January, and the third window is scheduled for June. For our kindergarten students, um, the window was November and then also in late May or early June of this year. And all students in grades one through three are given the test three times per year as well as two times per year in kindergarten. And just to share a little bit about the process that we use here in APS, typically after a test is completed, there's a Home Connect report, a Home Connect report that's generated for all students. And the Home Connect report shares student scores and provides information about whether or not 
a student is on track for reading success. And students that are in need of academic support are identified as a result of this process. And students who are not in need of support also have areas identified, um, areas of support, we call them. At the beginning of this academic year, only students that were identified as performing well below the benchmark received a Home Connect report, and that was sent via US mail. After the second administration this winter, students who were identified as performing in that category of well below, as well as students who were performing in the below category received a Home Connect report. And at some schools, all students received a Home Connect report, <clears throat> no matter uh, what their performance was. After the third administration in the summer of this year, all students within all seven elementary schools are going to receive a Home Connect report. Um, and follow-up discussions with families of students in the well below category usually begin at curriculum night uh, and they continue through the parent-teacher conference process that each school engages in. And there's a communication that is ongoing between teachers and students based on student progress and based on growth. And often members of the school team will reach out to families to continue the conversation as well as uh, to continue the planning that may be needed for a particular student. This is an example of a Home Connect report, which is um, pretty uh, detailed in terms of student performance. And based on the data typically from this assessment and student performance, schools use that to determine which actions within the general education setting are needed to meet a student's needs. This may include differentiating instruction or supplementing reading instruction. And student progress is monitored by school teams and teachers who review that student information um, and uh, work together to respond to that information. Teacher teams discuss progress and opportunities for small group instruction in response to the data as needed. Um, also, in response to the student data, teachers utilize the student support model that exists in schools um, in order to further the conversation with special educators and additional interventionists uh, at the table as well. And student benchmark data are documented within the APS Amplify dashboard that exists and available to all teachers. And progress monitoring of that data is collected and shared with teacher teams within schools. All students in K-3 are screened using the Dibbles, and students that are found to be performing below the benchmark of Dibbles may take additional assessments or screeners to determine specific areas of need. There are generally four other screeners that are used in addition to Dibbles for students that may fall in that particular category. And also a student that is found to be in supplementary reading instruction need may participate in one of these eight programs that is offered and uh, offered by a reading interventionist. A goal of the teaching and learning department is to have all Home Connect reports avail available to all families via an online portal um, beginning next school year. And this would provide our families with easier access to this information as well as remove some of the barriers that exist as it relates to US mail or snail mail. Um, and we've encountered a number of challenges to actually identifying a portal that exists, um, but we are pretty encouraged by some of the conversations that we've been having specifically with Amplify, and we think that we will be able to reach this particular goal by fall of next year. Some of the next steps also include um, making sure that we're identifying all of the processes that the district is currently using in a clearer manner for families. Um, and making sure that um, the processes that are used are consistent across all of our elementary schools. Um, and finally, uh, we're looking at how we can ensure that these reports are providing meaningful information and accurate information for families as well. Um, I've received a number of inquiries from families and different communi community members that have shared feedback around what's working and what's not working well, and we're using that information to make sure that we are creating processes across the system um, that are coherent, that are clear, and that are normed across schools. So this concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from the committee? Ms. Exton. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford Walker, for your <clears throat> presentation. Um, and I, some of my questions were answered, but I do want to just sort of reiterate some of the comments that I um, 
had made. I <clears throat> I appreciate the presentation and a lot of. Uh oh, my mic no. <laughs> okay, um, is in response to the to the legislation and sort of this is the expectation from the state for schools. Um, but I think, and, and you did respond to this in the presentation tonight, but I, I think it's really important for all families to receive this information um, in, a timely, in a timely manner. I think, one, it's just fair. If we're assessing children, we should be telling their families um, what, what the results are. But I also think that the composite score doesn't always give the full picture, and um, families need to have an opportunity to to see that and getting it when the progress reports come out um you know three months after the assessment is um you know there's a lot of time lost or maybe a lot of work has been done with that student but but families don't have that that picture um so that was one of the things i wanted to mention um my other question is um about the decision to administer the screener um, to kindergartners twice a year um, and specifically why November and, and June um, and the the are you using the beginning of the year um, benchmarks in November or are you using the middle of the year benchmarks in November just thinking about what that that looks like for kindergartners and how those um, how the results are going to present themselves to the yeah. family. Thank you. Thank you for your question. And thank you um, for your, your feedback that you provided me. Um, so in, in terms of your question about the kindergartners, historically, November has been uh, identified as the time to collect that data based on some of the beginning of the year structures and systems that teachers and educators are um, attempting to introduce our kindergartners to. And so there's been um, a, a, I think a really strong belief that students need that first couple of months to get used to just being in school and understanding what school is and understanding um, what systems and structures are. And so from my understanding, historically, it, November has been the marker that um, educators have found, or our kindergarten educators have found as the um, ideal time to introduce these assessments to students. Um, as part of the work that I'm currently undergoing, um, I'm looking at the time frame that is being used to collect this data um, because I think that uh, we can make some shifts in order to collect that data a little sooner. Great. Now I look forward to hearing how that, your, what you find and, and the outcomes and what you decide to do moving forward. Um, and then final comment, um, I would just like to su suggest that um, that the communication around what is the Dibbles and what is it screening and what the results are telling families um, perhaps come from you or the ELA department. Um, I just, it seems like principals were writing them and so different principals clearly had sort of different priorities or different things that they wanted to highlight and so different families across town are getting a slightly different message about what what it's screening for and what's going to happen next. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Gittleson. Um, I was, this is sort of repeating what Ms. Exton just said, but I was wondering if in the future there could be, oh, thank you, sorry, more, um, I don't know if a family forum or some sort of opportunity where rather than getting the information for the first time as you are receiving your scores and maybe those scores feel alarming or maybe they don't, um, sort of setting up expectations for parents um, or families. And I, I'm very glad we are working on getting it online because I don't think I'd actually mentioned this to Dr. Homan before, but m mine got lost in the mail. So I, one of the people for whom the US mail system was an ineffective way of getting my children's double scores. So fortunately, I got them from the school and I knew to ask for them. But if I had not known that, I just would never have had them. Um, but thank you, that's, uh, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Cardin. Thank you. Um, thanks for the presentation and for adding in some of my uh, additional information that I had requested. Um, still a couple of things. The, the letters that go out when somebody scores um, well below, do we, is that something that you've written? What, what, what does that look like? 
Yes, uh, so there are letters that do go out to students that are well below. Um, and those letters are sent out by, our, by every school automatically. Um, and those aren't adjusted, they're kind of the, the same letter. But what happens is when those meetings happen with the families of the students who are scoring in that particular category, the follow-up conversation is more specific to their need. Right, so can, we see, can, we, can we see that letter? You only linked to the initial absolutely. screener. Yes, okay. absolutely. Great. Um, and then at those, so, so who participates in those meetings? So it's the teacher that's yeah. participating. And then if there's any other staff member that's part of that particular child's um, plan in order to be successful in school, meaning a special educator or uh, MLL instructor, they can also <laughs> participate as well. But generally, it's the teacher and the parent or guardian. So there's not necessarily the reading interventionist present? That's someone also, in case, if a student is receiving tier two or tier three, for example, um, instruction, yes, they would be participating as well. Okay. Now, the, the state guidelines say that if somebody scores in the fifth percentile, they should automatically get tier three. Is that something we're doing? Um, I do not know if that okay. is actually the case. I will look into that to make sure that's happening. Um, I mean, that's not in the regulation. That's just in their, their sort of mm -hmm. suggested guidance. Um, Say what else do we have? I think that's it for now. I mean, the state the state does have um, what I thought were very well written notices, the the four different notices. I don't know if we utilize those or not. I think our initial notice is pretty vague. It doesn't really say much about what's what you know what what the assessment is going to do, what the process is. The state version is actually more robust, so I, I would suggest we go back and think about. Um, making that notice a little bit more robust. All right. Thank you. I think you. that's all. Our, Thanks. Our review. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. I have one more question then. Go ahead. <laughs> Didn't want to take up too much time. So in the in the sample score that you you have um, in the presentation, uh, where did that go? Close that by mistake. Hold on. <clears throat> If, if um, this student on this on the decoding subtest was in the yellow range, if if and, and this is getting pretty granular, I know you're not involved in the day to day um, operation of this, but um, if we had a student who who fell in the red zone under decoding, but what other, what otherwise was not in the well below. Would that trigger anything other than the teacher, you know, make, adjusting their own practices? Ideally, it would just trigger that, and the mm -hmm. teacher would be equipped to respond to what the specific need is. Um, in terms of a student, let's say, receiving Tier 2 instruction, that's what the total composite score mm -hmm. would, would tell us if that's what's needed. Um, but ideally, the sub score here is not... Uh, use in isolation to make that determination. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to add that um, the, they do then, after the administration um, at the grade level, we have grade level team meetings that are data meetings. And so though that grade level team sits down with their literacy um, coach and reading specialist to look at all of those scores. So they are looking at those subtests. And even if your composite score was not you know, in the red, yeah. you know, but there were some subtests. They are using that because actually those subtests allow us to target the instruction. The mm -hmm. composite gives us an overall score, but it's the subtest that actually targets the intervention. So they use that to then make their intervention groups, whether like um, Dr. Ford Walker said, you might be getting a second dose in your classroom of foundations. You might be seeing a reading specialist is pulling that, but the grade level teams look at that data through our data meetings. Great. Thank you. Uh, and let me just ask one technical question. Uh, assuming that the uh, double scores are coming as a PDF, do we have the capacity to put that into PowerSchool so that parents can access it that way? Oops. So PowerSchool was uh, the initial uh, portal that we looked into because it's, I think, the most easily accessible and often accessible, but that is not an option. So now we are left with looking at our other portal, which is Amplify. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Uh, oh, Dr. Allison, and Dr. Allison Ampey's got her hand up. Yes, Dr. Allison Ampey. Thank you. 
Um, you just asked one of my questions. Um, I'm confused why, I'm wondering why we can't use PowerSchool, uh, but, um, cause I'm worried we're already asking people to use it for other things. And I'm worried if we're sending them somewhere else that this is getting really messy. I mean, I think elementary student, elementary parents already have problems just connecting with the schools online with PowerSchool, at least that's been my impression in the past. So that's one question. Um, but the second one is just for the students who are scoring well below, I understand we're rolling out online uh, communication, but are we still going to mail out their reports um, next year? And I understand what Ms. Goodelson said that the mail is not perfect either, but I'm worried that we don't want them to fall through the cracks. So I'll start with your second question. Um, our primary form is going to be online access. Of course, there are going to be scenarios and cases where, where that will not work for um, a set of people in our in our uh, schools. And so what schools will do is um, have the names and have the families identified for who that does not work for. And they'll either have it emailed um, if that works, or then uh, if that doesn't work, then also receive them physical mailing through the US mail. But our goal is to try to have the electronic version available and easily accessible. That brings me to your first question. I completely understand and realize that um, adding on another form of communication through a different portal may complicate things for folks, which is why we initially started with PowerSchool. Um, and it's a simple, what I think is a simple problem and many others on the team think, which is essentially, um, student ID numbers need to be listed uh, and PowerSchool doesn't have the platform um, available in a way where those, where number one, where the ID is listed on the report and that where their software can pull that and put it into their particular platform. And so there have been requests from a number of districts around the country for this to actually take place because everyone is um, engaging in these conversations at in, in various districts and so the need is, you know, it's quite a large one. And so PowerSchool themselves understands that and they're working on a fix. Mm -hmm. In the meantime, because we have no idea around the timeline for that, in the meantime, we need to pursue other options. And so the other option right now is looking at Amplify, which is a portal that families do have access to. We would have to, of course, look at the impact of using an Amplify and look at what that you know, what complications that might add, such as password retrieval and all of the technical things, um, which are things that we're considering. Um, but right now, I think the, the priority is to make sure that we can provide better access so that uh, reports aren't getting lost in the mail or aren't received by families. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Looking around, any more questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which will be the superintendent's proposed budget. Uh, Superintendent Holman. All right, folks. So I am pleased to be here to present the um, FY25 proposed budget. I'm joined by uh, Jose Farias, who is our assistant director of finance. Um, we, I just want to sort of explain kind of why we're here, when we're here, um, taking a look at the FY25 proposed budget. Mr. Mason um, had a little one not too long ago and went on a parental leave um, and has since also informed us that he will be joining uh, Chelsea, the city of Chelsea as the deputy um, town manager or city manager before too long. And so Mr. Farias and I, along with uh, Leanne Wilsinski, who's a consultant who's helping us out um, and is on the Zoom, have been working diligently on the FY25 budget with a little bit of help from Mr. Mason, which has delayed us a little bit, three weeks, um, in getting this proposed budget to you. So I want to thank you, first of all, for your patience uh, as we worked on this. We've had a lot of meetings with Budget Subcommittee and are pleased to bring you our plan for FY25. So with that said, I'll get into it. Our budget priorities uh, for FY25 are as follows. Um, the first priority, obviously, was to make sure that we funded the override um, competitive compensation commitments that we 
uh, talked to voters about at length as we headed into the fall voting season. Um, we were really excited about that override being passed and are dedicated to making sure that we set aside funds and resources to meet the commitments of that um, of, of that override. We wanted to make sure we ensure we left aside adequate funds for what will be um, a 40% projected increase in electricity supply rates. Um, this is happening all over the country, all over the, the um, Commonwealth, and is having a pretty significant impact on the FY25 budget. We're adjusting elementary staffing levels because we have decreasing enrollments, but we want to make sure that we sustain existing service levels and even add uh, resources in particular areas that will benefit our focal groups. We're maintaining our staffing to support needs in special education and expanding our and what we know are expanding secondary enrollments. We've also made some prior investments in secondary enrollments that I will try to highlight. Um, and we're, of course, continuing our implementation of the five-year strategic plan and making sure that we're maintaining our focus on focal groups, which I'll talk about in just a moment. I want to start by highlighting our 10-year district enrollment trends. So what you see here is a graph that uh, should be relatively familiar to those of you on the committee um, and to folks who have seen some of our presentations to the town. The blue line is our actual enrollment from um, FY18 until now, and then you see also a projection up to FY28. Um, the other lines are different projections that we've received from um, different organizations as well as an internal projection. That's the gray line, and that's the line we primarily use to project sections because it's the one that has proven the most consistent. Um, what you'll see is that we are trending along that gray line, uh, but we've, we're slightly below where we had projected our enrollments for uh, this fiscal year, fiscal 24. The purple lines are two projections that we got from Decision Insight a couple of years ago, and the um, orange line was a projection that we got prior to the pandemic from McKibben. Uh, so you can see the dip in enrollment, and then you can see the uh, trend moving upwards and also starting to level out, which is where we're at now. I want to speak a little bit about our focal group populations. If you recall, there are five focal groups identified in the strategic plan, and I'm going to talk about kind of what's happening with the populations of those focal groups in Arlington Public Schools because I think it's important for thinking about how we're allocating resources. So one of the focal groups is um, students who identify as BIPOC, uh, particularly students who identify as Black or African American, and students who identify as Hispanic or multiracial. Um, so are, we have stable populations of students who are identifying as Black or African American or Asian right now in the system but we have a steadily increasing population of students who are identifying as Hispanic or multi-race non-Hispanic over the past five years. So our population for that focal group is going up. Uh, we also have steadily increasing populations of English learners and students for whom English is not their first language and families. Um, a steadily increasing population of students with IEPs, students from in some income insecure households or low-income households, and students who identify as non-binary. That's that lower green line. Um, I just want to note that it's not surprising that this line is going up, and we don't feel that it's representative necessarily of all of the students who might be identifying as non-binary because this is really new data. It's very recent that we're even capturing it, as you can see, because it was not even uh, represented in 2019 at all. And that's because it wasn't collected. Um, and what I want to highlight in highlighting the focal groups is that a number of these focal groups also are captured in high needs populations. And I think what's perhaps most telling is this trend, which is that APS has a steadily increasing population of students whose needs are requiring additional material resources, additional support, additional staffing. Um, those resources absolutely are required in order for us to meet our five-year strategic plan goals. And so this line shows uh, APS students who are identified as high needs, which is an aggregate calculation, is one you see a lot in the school improvement plans um, because we sometimes have smaller populations of some of the other focal groups, but this will capture more of our students because it puts some of these focal needs together. Um, and that population has been very steadily increasing since 2019 in Arlington. So I will get into the nuts and bolts of some of our numbers for FY25 because everything I just shared is driving some of our calculations. Um, this is a uh, projection of revenue by funding sources from FY21 through the upcoming year. What you'll notice here is that um, Chapter 70 funds and town contributions continue to increase. The COVID-19 um, grants have expired in FY25, so are no longer a source of revenue. Um, and there's a gap um, that is a little bit growing between what Chapter 70 contributes and what the town contributes. However, that gap decreased this year because our Chapter 70 allocation was significantly lower than anticipated. 
Um, this is FY25 funding sources across all of our funds. Again, you'll notice that the COVID-19 revenues are no longer represented there. Um, Circuit Breaker is contributing 2.1% to revenue, special revenue to 1.9, that's our revolving accounts. Um, grants 3.2% and our town appropriation is larger than it has been in previous years at 90, almost 93%. <clears throat> This table represents our FY25, it should say at the top, sorry about that, proposed uh, budget expenses by category. Um, what you will notice is that there is a change overall um, in various categories here, a change in 11% increase for special education, um, a change of uh, 7173999 across all accounts. Um, and I just want to note that there is a new category here of contingencies, and that is a net of funding to be used to support competitive compensation and our budget additions and efficiencies that we haven't yet identified in position control, because there are positions that are being um, potentially eliminated, but it, we don't quite know yet because of the time of year which positions exactly those will be. Um, also, the 400000 in budget contingencies for FY24, if you recall, are funds that will be allocated by the town. Um, as part of some of the conversations we we're having with long range planning to support competitive compensation, but have not yet been allocated um, towards salaries. These are our anticipated funding sources and how they break out across the long range plan for this fiscal year. And I want to talk about the proposed budget changes um, across the FY25 budget. So we'll start with contractual obligations and salary adjustments. Um, overall, the, the APS will spend $3,800,053, 151 more um, dollars on our contractual obligations and as a result of salary adjustments in FY25 than we did in FY24. We're setting aside a significant allocation for collective for the purposes of collective bargaining with Unit A, about 1.7 million or 1,699,000. Um, the, there is a uh, line here that represents the Unit D FY25 increase that I want to explain a little bit. Um, it's 344,457, and what this represents is the increases in salaries for Unit D employees compared against the original contractual agreement, but correcting for the $400,000 allocation that will happen in FY24 because that goes into the base. So the overall difference between what we would have paid in FY25 for unit D, for the increase to unit D under the original agreement, and what we will pay is actually 744,457. But if you correct that for the 400,000 that's going into the base um, budget, then you arrive at the 344,000 investment because it's offset by that 400,000. Um, so if you put 1.7 million together with 344,000, you arrive at about 2 million, which was the commitment that we made in the override to contributing to um, salary adjustments and competitive compensation for our educators in Unit A and Unit D. So that's for what those two lines. Home, unit D is? Oh, sorry. Um, unit D is our paraprofessionals and Unit A is our teachers. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a $436,000 allocation to support utility increases, as I mentioned, because our supply rates are going up, about a 2% adjustment up in departmental budgets, and then um, some efficiencies and additions that I will talk about in just a moment. I want to take a few minutes to talk about our ESSER 3 um, assessment and what we're going to choose to adopt and what we will be um, sort of moonlighting and saying we're not going to necessarily keep this in the FY25 budget. Uh, we're going we're gonna to sunset that and not bring it in. So um, maintained from ESSER 3, our diversity, equity, and inclusion specialist is an addition that we had in our ESSER dollars and as part of our COVID-19 grants and we'll maintain that in the system. Our director of research, data, and accountability was an addition this year that we will also be keeping. Uh, we have an Arlington High School that should say assistant director of school counseling um, and a communication specialist at the district level at the, at the FTE rate of 0.6. So the reason we're keeping some of these things is to make sure that we're increasing our administrative support at Arlington High School. There are an, an increasing number of students at Arlington High School, and when we thought about the fact that there would be required administrative additional support dedicated to that school, we wanted to focus on making sure that that was supporting student mental health um, and the counseling services that we provide to our students. We are trying to increase our capacity to maintain functional data systems, as you've seen in several presentations this year. We'd also like to make sure that in future years, 
data, our re research data and accountability department is providing reports directly to teachers, um, helping us make sure that we get reports out to families. So that team has really been instrumental in helping us think about what the connections could be um, to families and getting those reports out, such as our Dibbles scores. Um, and we want to maintain that work, and we want to increase support for professional learning um, and our consistency of communications to families and staff when it comes to communications with families. And so th that's why we're maintaining those from SR3. Uh, we're also eliminating a few positions from what we had used those SR3 dollars for this year. So we'll be eliminating the Director of Leadership Development and Onboarding, who you had uh, heard from previously, not because we don't think that that work is exceptionally important, but because we knew that the whole point of that role was to build some systems, to build some plans, to leave us some recommendations that we would then embed in the capacity of the existing system. Um, we've done some work looking at liaison structures um, for families, and we had piloted a family liaison at Gibbs this year. Uh, we are wanting to reassess that liaison model, work directly with the Welcome Center, and think about ways that we can do that, uh, both efficiently and in ways that increase the capacity of our educators to work with families. And we're not sure that um, the system's going to be able to sustain full-time liaisons at every school. So we want to take a look at that model and think about what uh, alternatives we could, we could consider. And then um, for communications specialist, we had put, point, we had put a full-time, but it's shared between two staff members, and so we're going to eliminate point four of that support from the ESSER three grant and not pull that over into the general fund. So I want to name a few commitments that we had made previously that are maintained in this budget, because I think it's easy not to see some of those. Um, we've been, because we had additional revenues, because we had other funds available in previous years, we've been preemptively planning for what we knew would be increasing secondary enrollments. So there are some commitments that were made in previous budget years using a combination of funds that we're keeping in this budget and that I want to name specifically as things we're sustaining because they come at a resource cost and have an impact on those um, contractual obligations that we have. So we added 6.2 positions in the FY24 budget to Arlington High School. Those were teachers, paraprofessionals, a theater manager, other positions that were linked to the opening of the new high school. Wings, we added um, almost four 3.9 positions at um, OMS and Gibbs in the FY24 budget, including an expansion of the team chair role um, and various teacher positions. We've added LC at OMS in 22 and 23. We did half of the LC in FY22, the other half in FY23. Um, and that was to support what we knew were going to be growing enrollments over the next couple of years. We also expanded some specialist staff at OMS last year, knowing that those sections would be getting bigger over the next year or two. Um, we've added staff and sections uh, at Gibbs in FY23 because we had one of the bigger class sizes going to Gibbs in FY23, and we've maintained that staffing level. So that will support an, another increase in the student population at Gibbs next school year in FY25. Um, our monotony paraprofessionals shifted to the SSP pay rate in FY24, and that will be maintained in the new Unit D agreement and is another investment that we've made in our Unit D paraprofessionals. Um, and in this budget in FY25, we're maintaining elementary class sizes at under 25 students per section. So while there are reductions at the elementary level due to enrollments, we're making sure we sustain both the service rate, so we're not eliminating any special education positions, for example, or any ML positions, multilingual learner positions, um, only the <coughs> class section levels, which actually comes at a service increase if you think about the fact that there are fewer students that our special educators and other service providers will be providing for. for. Um, so all of those commitments are sustained in FY25. So here are some of the efficiencies that we're considering. Um, what you'll see here is a total of five classroom teachers. It's actually a total of six sections from FY24 to FY25 that are being reduced. Um, it's six because we, we added a kindergarten section in FY24 after the budget that we're now not including in FY25. So that's why that sixth section mm -hmm. is not included on this list, um, as well as the paraprofessional that comes along with that section. Um, it's just sort of net neutral because it wasn't in FY24 to begin with, and this is a budget to budget comparison. Um, we're um, eliminating about 1.0 in PE specialists due to the number of sections um, and the number of specialists that we need in order to provide the number of special sections of PE that we provide for students on a weekly basis. Uh, we are reducing one curriculum specialist at the district level. We currently have three of those. An instructional coach at the district level that is tied to mathematics, um, at, and that's at the <laughs> middle school level. Um, and a library paraprofessional role in at about the level of 0.2 that we had had to support some of the special um, 
the specialist coverage at the elementary level. The library paraprofessionals would occasionally teach classes with a reduction in sections, may not need to teach as many of those special classes. So that's a total budget efficiency level of um, 8.2 FTEs or $567,000. And here are our additions. I want to name something explicitly about these additions in that these additions, while they are additions from FY24 to FY25, a number of them won't necessarily be felt insofar as they're already here. So most of these additions have come after the budget. These are um, positions that already exist within the system. Um, and we're, like I said, sustaining them. So first is a classroom teacher. This is the only one that that is not true for. Uh, a new classroom teacher and specialized support paraprofessional at Monotomy Preschool because Monotomy is adding a classroom because they are now in their new space. I knew this was a major priority for a number of um, committee members. And we want to make sure that Monotomy can take in as many students as possible because of the importance of that early education for our students. Uh, we are adding, we are keeping the following positions. Uh, we added an inclusion specialist after the FY24 budget at Thompson, and we're maintaining that. We will have some larger class sizes still at Thompson because of the limitations of space, though I am working on buffer zone um, strategy that will help us swing, hopefully, some students out of that zone so that we can reduce some of the enrollments there. Uh, we had added a BCBA full-time at Stratton, and we're actually backfilling that at the district level. And so that's an addition of 1.0 so that uh, Stratton with the SLC program that is there can have the full-time support of a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, we are also adding three specialized support paraprofessionals we actually already have at Stratton to support the SLC there. Um, we've added various one-to-one -one teaching assistants for students as needed as per their IEPs over the course of the year in special education, uh, specialized support paraprofessional at Arlington High School to support one of the programs, um, a tutor at Arlington High School that runs the Learning Center and is available to students for Tier 2 support on any homework that they might need, um, and is there actually also running some student-level tutoring um, where students can help their peers with their homework, which is a great addition to the Arlington High School uh, cadre of services that they're providing. We've added two custodians at Arlington High School since the opening of the um, new wing. We haven't been able to fill those positions yet, but we're hopeful that we'll be able to before too long. That's 2.0. Um, the 3.6 positions from the ESSER 3 allocation that I already mentioned and an administrative assistant for the District Welcome Center because we moved over here. We need to make sure that people can access the building, can get in, um, and that role is also serving the um, Welcome Center as an administrative assistant and the Department of Equity, Belonging, Inclusion, and Justice um, in, in an administrative capacity. So that's total budget additions of 19.2 or 1 million. $147,748.99. Um, I do want to name a few future additions if funds allow for it when we are at the conclusion of collective bargaining um, and as we continue to work on uh, funds for FY24, should funds become available or should we have savings from vacancies, which is a possibility, a reality, something that we've had over the past several years, then there are a few things we could consider funding. Uh, if there are resources available. One is ad additional clerical support for special education department. This was a request that came through and something that I think would greatly benefit that department and making sure that we're meeting timelines and getting all of the paperwork that comes along with those requirements completed. Um, potentially special education liaisons or service providers. We had a number of requests for that as well in our requests for this year. Elementary librarians was a major priority that we would consider funding if funds would allow for it. Um, custodial support across the district has been a challenge, so we might take a look at that as well. Social workers were requested in a number of sites across the system, uh, and reading additional reading intervention support was also requested. So should we have the funds available, we will come back to some of those requests that were top of mind for many of you and for us, uh, and see what we can put into the FY25 budget at the conclusion um, of our planning and finalization of that budget. We have a few remaining steps left, as you all know, uh, where we have a school committee meeting for a public hearing in a couple of weeks, one week after that, a tentative date to approve the proposed budget. Uh, finance committee we will be visiting on March 25th and town meeting opens in April. Happy to take any questions. Any questions from the members of the committee? Ms. Gittleson. Um, I was, this is my first budget season, so um, looking, going through the 
all of the um, line items and cost centers uh, was a challenge. Um, and I'm wondering, you spoke to this a little bit, if it's possible for us, me and the people at home, is if there's a way to get a breakdown of where and how we spend our special education budget. There's a lot of interest right now in you know, different services that people need. And I think it would be helpful to understand how, you know, are the, you know, reading specialists versus evaluations versus um, legal fees. I know this might not be able to be answered tonight, but I do think having that kind of information would be really helpful for me and for other members of the public. Okay. Um, I can't answer with specificity right now, uh, but I can say that the, ver the vast majority of our funding for special education goes towards positions in that department. Um, as you can see, most of our investments for FY25 are on positions in that department. Um, and there's about a $2.5 million increase in special education funds for FY25. The, uh, how that all breaks out, I'd have to um, work with Ms. Elmer and, and the finance department to sort of get uh, a little bit more fine detail for you on. Okay. And I also just wanted to reiterate my the, the idea of if money becomes available, the priority to be placed on adding the elementary school librarians. Mm -hmm. Any other comments or questions from the committee? Mr. Thielman. I just want some clarification for, on the ask for the high school regarding the building. So there's two custodians. There's the manager of the of the uh, uh, theater. And that, so those are the three kind of. Um, so there were some uh, other additions in FY24 that like uh, somebody to manage the cafe and to work directly with the students on um, getting the cafe up and running, which it sounds like it is, which is fantastic. Um, and the also the um, there's a copy center upstairs. So there was an FTE associated with that. Um, it was an SSP FTE yeah. in FY24. Um, and there's uh, so there's the theater manager, which we added in FY24. Um, the biggest concern that has come from the opening of the second wing has been around custodial support. Right. Okay. And so that's that's, that's what we're prioritizing. That's in prioritizing. Should, should funds become available? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Well, but there's two custodians that we haven't filled yet. Correct. They were posted in FY24, added in FY24 after the 24 budget, but they haven't been filled yet. Right. But those are. But those, Jeff. Those are part of the fy25 yeah, budget right. for sure right. yes yeah I, I i get that yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. but you would be adding more than that should funding become available. should funding become available that's on the list i would say probably below yeah. a couple of the other things we've talked about yeah. um, one of the challenges that we have with custodians at the high school in particular is that when there is an absence at another school of another custodian we will often pull from the high school because they have the most custodians but what that means with a building this big is that on a day like that which is almost every day um, you have some absence somewhere, yeah. then you're short staffed at the high school. So that is additional too at the high school will make a big difference. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cardin. Yeah, I, just, I just wanted to point out there is a schedule in the budget on special education and interventions. Yes. One of the many schedules. Yeah, no, and <laughs> okay. I'm sort of working my way yeah. through it, but so to level, translate yeah. to that to what is happening in reality. Yeah, is, mm -hmm. okay. And if there are specific questions about that, Ms. Gittleson, and you want to reach out to myself and Ms. Elmer, we can okay. search that out for you. Seeing no further comments. Uh, uh, oh, Dr. Allison Ampey. Oh, Dr. Allison Ampey. I was looking for a little hand icon. Okay. Right. Dr. This Allison is, Ampey. Um, <laughs> that one? Okay. So uh, first, I know when we were talking through how we're going to do this budget we had discussed potentially having a budget subcommittee meeting next week which has not yet been scheduled and i just want to reiterate my hope that we would do that and we invite any okay i'm not chair of that committee so i can't actually say that but i expect the chair would invite anyone uh any of the other school committee members who have questions or comments about the budget to come um, and then second, I just wanted, uh, Dr. Homan, I appreciate all the hard work that you and Mr. Ferris and, and uh, all the other people have put into this. 
Um, looking through the budget, we've used the same um, messaging for the first parts, and it continues to have things which I personally feel are errors. And I guess, in addition to my little hand, I'm stomping my little foot. And um, I am going to share with you what I think those are and perhaps some suggestions for different uh, wording. It, it's things, let me, sorry, I'm on the wrong page. I'm away at this, I'm away at this dark. Uh, it's things, for example, concerning chapter 70 and the way the information is written in the budget book, it suggests that the town basically is a pass through for chapter 70. And as we all know, or as members of the long range planning committee and actually all school committee members now, because we've been working on the override know that's not how it works here. All the money comes into a big pot. It gets stirred up together and then the town dumps out money. You know, yes, it's an interesting and important uh, amount to be keeping track of how much chapter 70 we're getting but it's not you know it could go to zero and the town would still be um hopefully uh fulfilling their obligation to us and i'm just there there's things like that in the messaging at the start and i just like to get some of those cleaned up or at least have that discussion and if i get overruled ruled, i get overruled but it just it concerns me that it's giving the wrong impression to our families and then when we have to do things like override set starts getting they start from a position of confusion which isn't helpful so that's all for right now thank you any other comments questions with that we move forward to superintendent's update okay one second Nope. Hold on. Technical difficulties. Okay. All right. So our a number of our AHS students went to Quebec over the February break, and they wanted to say a special thank you to school committee for approving that trip. That's a picture of them. Um, enjoying the very, very cold weather, I heard. It was freezing. Uh, but they had a grand time and sent a lot of pictures back uh, with them mm -hmm. and were really excited about this inaugural opportunity to visit Quebec. I have a few updates on administrative searches. We are currently in the process of, um, well, we have actually identified finalists and we're planning on announcing those as soon as we can, hopefully Monday. Um, and then we'll be running some finalist uh, rounds through next week um, and probably into the following week and then identifying the principal for the Hardy School very soon and announcing that as well. Uh, we have some upcoming searches, one for K-12 math director. If you recall, our former math director moved into the data and accountability role. So we have an interim in place right now. We also have an interim Metco director in place right now. So we'll be doing a search for that permanent position. Um, and right now, as noted, uh, we are currently looking for and are posted for an interim CFO um, and or we will be running a search for assistant superintendent of finance and operations in um, the absence of Mr. Mason, who we will miss very much. I have a small kindergarten registration update with more data on this to come very soon. Um, as of yesterday, we have 152 kindergartners approved, 148 kindergartners pending, and 300 total in the queue to be registered for next school year. Um, as indicated in the kindergarten letter, they uh, the sort of deadline to apply for first consideration around buffer zones was up until the 28th, and so I'll be sending buffer zone assignments uh, super soon, as soon as we have all of these um, applications sort of organized in a way that I can assign buffer zones, prioritizing some swoop away from East Arlington um, in buffer zone assignments, and then we'll get that back out to families so that they can make decisions about things like after school care. So we try to coordinate the after school care with kindergarten registration launch. So that's kindergarten registration update. I do want to note that your enrollments don't reflect actual numbers yet for kindergarten, but I'm hoping that the next time I send enrollment data that'll reflect the actuals for kindergarten. So right now you're still working with a projection um, in the enrollment data that I sent along. I have a quick athletics update for the winter season. The wrestling team won their sixth consecutive Middlesex League um, division championship 
and uh, MIA Division I Metro Central Sectional Championship. The boys hockey team won the Middlesex League Championship, um, highest ranked public school in the Division I state tournament. Very exciting. Girls hockey qualified for the state tournament. Boys basketball won the Middlesex League Championship for the second straight year. Nordic Ski competed in their first ever state championship meet. Girls track finished third at the Middlesex League meet. Both boys and girls track um, had a lot of students compete at sectionals and state as well. Boys swimming finished second at the Middlesex League meet. Gymnastics finished sixth at the Middlesex League meet and qualified for sectionals for the first time in over 10 years as they've already gotten shouted out, yay. Um, and the Alpine ski team had another successful season with three students qualifying for the state meet. Um, as And there were a lot of other successes in the, in the season as well, but these are just a few of the highlights from the winter season. And I also provided your enrollments. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions? Hearing none, we're ready to go to the policies for second read. We are pulling off of the list BEDH and JLCD, which were referred to council, and we're holding KDC uh, because we need to assure that uh, we have the technical capacity to do that. So if there are any requests to pull anything off the list beyond those three, uh, I'll entertain any questions about that. Uh, hearing none, then I would go and present, ask for a motion to adopt the remaining policies on second read. Can you say the third one that you were pulling? Uh, we're pulling KDC. K okay, sorry. KDC, which sort of requires a little pop-up. We don't have the technical capacity to do that right now. Any comments or questions? Hearing none, I will. Just the ones, yeah, you're the ones you're pulling in. Yeah. We are, uh, we are removed. We are pulling BEDH yep. and JLCD, which were referred to council. Okay. Yes. And KDC, which for reasons of the technology, other than that, all, all the rest are ready to go, uh, should the committee choose to adopt them. <coughs> And when you say council, it's town council. Right? Town council, yeah. Uh, I move approval of the remaining motions. Okay, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Ms. Second. Gittleson. Uh, any other comment? And it's a roll call. Dr. Allison Epi. Yes. Ms. Gittleson. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Ms. Morgan. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Ms. Exton. Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. That's a seven nothing vote. Uh, seven fifty mm, uh, consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests. In which event the item will be considered in this normal sequence. Warrant two four two zero nine in the amount of five hundred forty seven thousand. $377.77, dated February 21st, in Arlington School Committee draft regular meeting minutes February 9th, 2024. Motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Ms. Exton, second by? Second. Mr. Thielman, roll call vote. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And I vote in the affirmative. That's a 7 nothing vote. <laughs> Subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Uh, budget, Mr. Cardin. Uh, we've met a couple of times to uh, talk about progress on the budget book. Um, we will try to schedule a meeting next week uh, to uh, receive any uh, feedback on the draft budget book ahead of the hearing. Um, we do have a meeting scheduled on the 12th, like the day before the hearing, which is not going to be very helpful. So other than the 13th. Um, so we'll try to get one scheduled for next week. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Exton, Community Relations. Thank you. Um, there was a school committee chat hosted on Tuesday, February 27th. Um, 
that was well attended. There are notes from the chat. Thank you, Ms. Morgan, for taking those are in Novus. Um, the next school committee chat is on Saturday, April 6th at 11 a.m., which I also believe is election day. Mm -hmm. um, and that will just be school committee members. I think there was some confusion from some members of the community about the school committee chats and who would be there. Um, and the subcommittee had decided to try having administration attend as well to provide some more instant and direct feedback and answer some questions. Um, but we also had feedback from committee members that having um, chats that just have school committee members would also be helpful. So the next one um, on Saturday, April 6th, will just have school committee members. Uh, and I think that's all there is to report. Okay, thank you. Facilities, Mr. Thielman. No report. Policies and procedures, Mr. Schlickman, no report. Our Arlington High School Building Committee, Mr. Thielman. Where we meet next uh, Tuesday. Oh, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Liaison. Look, when the uh, CIA subcommittee will be meeting. Ah, um, CIA. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, it's... you hide over there in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Please <laughs> make it about me. Um, uh, uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Ms. Morgan. Yes, we are meeting on uh, Monday, the 18th at two o'clock. Okay. Your meetings are always wonderful. So I've been told. Liaison reports. Any liaison reports? Any announcements? Uh, then we are proceeding to future agenda items. Any future agenda items? Hearing none, executive session. Uh, we will be looking to ex enter executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be con uh, conducted with AEA unit A negotiations and to discuss the deployment of security personnel and or devices or strategies with respect there too. Do I have a motion to go into executive session? So moved. Moved by Mr. Thielman. Second. Second by Ms. Exton. Roll call vote. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Gittleson? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Ms. Morgan? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Ms. Exton? Yes. And I vote on the affirmative. That is a seven nothing vote. We are entering executive session and we will not return to a public session thereafter. Thank you. Mm -hmm.